Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Simply put, I became a nurse because I wanted to help others. The healthcare field comes with a power, a power to save lives. But sometimes, as we've seen in cases like Dr. Harold Shipman and Jolly Jane Toppin, people abuse that power and use it to take lives, something I think is the ultimate betrayal of trust. The trust we all have when we put our lives in the hands of a medical health professional. The case of Vicki Dawn Jackson is no different. As a teenage girl in a small Texas town, she worked tirelessly for many years towards her dream of being a nurse. And when she reached that dream, it was euphoric for her. Her patients adored her for her kindness. Her work colleagues admired her for her strong work ethic and dedication to her profession. She was sweet, sensitive, the kind of person that kept a smile on her face even in the toughest of times. But her Nightingale career came to a screeching halt when she was discovered to be a serial killer. Not of random strangers, but her own patients. In just a few months, Vicky had poisoned to death 10 patients and attempted to kill many more. With each successful kill, Vicky grew bolder and more confident in her newfound power. Sometimes she would poison several patients in the span of a few minutes, rushing out of their rooms and desperately calling on other nurses to help revive them. She took on the job of sending her condolences to her victims' family members and even seeking them out in public when the occasion arose. What changed in Vicky? Did she simply lose sight of why she wanted to be a nurse in the first place? Or was murder her plan all along? Audible is the home of storytelling. Access titles in every genre and new formats like podcasts, the words, plus music series, and theatrical performances, all in one app. The newly included selection of titles makes Audible membership so much more valuable and gives all members a chance to discover new favorites. And that includes my own book, Special Agent, My Life on the Front Lines in the FBI. Lots of great stories in there, including investigating the Tylenol murders and the Unabomber. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche. I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Vicki Dawn Jackson, Serial Killer Nurse. Nurse Vicki Dawn Jackson first began working at Nakona General Hospital 
the 18-room local hospital in Nakona, Texas, while she was in high school. She started as a nurse's aide and worked her way up. Her dream was to become a registered nurse one day and able to take on more responsibilities. She earned a reputation for being kind to the patients, and it seemed to everyone that she took a lot of pride in her job. Nakona sits about 100 miles from Dallas and just south of the Oklahoma border. When Nurse Vicki, as she was known, was working there, the town had just over 3,000 residents. Everyone knew each other, and Vicki was no exception. Nearly all of her patients were neighbors or relatives, people she'd known most of her life. But by December of 2000, Vicki Dawn Jackson's life seemed to be falling apart. At age 34, she was unhappily married to her third husband, who also worked at the hospital. And the two children from her second marriage had grown weary of the tensions at home, so they moved in with their biological father. The stress weighed heavily on Vicki. She was experiencing mood swings and felt depressed and unloved. But she continued to work nights at Nakona General. After all, it was her calling, and caring for the infirm always made her feel good about herself. On December 11, 2000, she headed in for her regular shift. When she arrived, she was tasked with caring for 100-year-old Donnie Jennings, a well-known resident of the area who had been admitted a few days earlier for dehydration. Donnie was no stranger to Nurse Vicky. They met years earlier when Vicky cared for Donnie at her previous job, a local nursing home. Donnie Jennings was not an easygoing patient. She was very demanding and had a habit of smacking the nurses on the hand or spitting on them if she was unhappy. That night, Vicky went into Donnie's room and injected a medication into the elderly woman's IV. The medicine entered her bloodstream and within seconds, she had trouble breathing. Then her respiratory system began to shut down. Her lungs were in effect paralyzed. She turned blue, foamed at the mouth, and then she was dead. Donnie was 100 years old, so her death was not entirely unexpected. But the substance that killed her was. It was not typically used to treat the ailments that Donnie had. It was a muscle relaxant called myvacurium chloride. Myvacurium chloride is used in small doses to prepare patients for surgery and to ease the process of intubation, putting a tube down their throat. It works as an anesthetic, relaxing skeletal muscles and temporarily paralyzing the respiratory system. It may sound dangerous and even scary, but when used correctly and with the tube present allowing for oxygen to flow into the patient's lungs, the effects of myvacurium chloride quickly wear off. But when too high a dose is administered, the body's respiratory system shuts down and the effects are lethal. Had Nurse Vicky made a simple mistake, a medication error? I will tell you this was not a slip up or a simple error, not at all. She knew the effects of the drug, that there was no doctor's order for her to give it, and yet she went into Donnie Jennings' room with the sole intention of killing her. A nurse's aide soon found Donnie dead in her hospital room, but because of her advanced age, 
the medical staff assumed she died of natural causes, which is why I think Vicky chose Donnie to be her first kill. Vicky took it upon herself to deliver the sad news to one of Donnie's daughters. She gave her condolences and went back to work. No one suspected Nurse Vicky was responsible for Donnie's death. And I also have no doubt at all that Vicky got a sadistic kick out of delivering the sad news. Donnie Jennings had survived 100 plus years on the face of this earth, having survived the 1918 killer influenza pandemic, the Great Depression, and two world wars. But she could not survive one single night with Vicki Don Jackson as her nurse. One week later, Vicki was assigned to two new patients at Nakona General, an 87-year-old with a broken leg and a 62-year-old being treated for cirrhosis, also known as severe liver damage. Armed once again with a syringe of myvicarium chloride, Vicky administered an injection to each of them. By the time she left the second room, a swarm of nurses were already trying to revive the patient in the first room. As they frantically worked to save the patient's life, Vicky reminded them to check on the patient in the second room. I see that move on her part as a subconscious. If you think that was something, wait till you see what else is going on just down the hall. Both of Vicky's patients that night died from the injections she gave them. But when it came to murdering people, Vicky was just getting started. Within days, she found more targets. It was Christmas Eve 2000, about two weeks since Nurse Vicky's first murder. A 50-year-old woman with severe back pain and an 87-year-old man who was disoriented were admitted to the hospital. Despite their vastly different conditions, Vicky gave each of them my vicurium chloride, lethal doses. With five patients dead in a matter of weeks, other hospital workers began to take notice. They wondered how five patients receiving around-the-clock care could pass away so suddenly. Despite their initial concerns, work at Nakona General continued as normal. Nurse Vicky, or perhaps I should say the Grim Reaper, would strike again two more times before the end of the year. An 80-year-old man suffering from a fit of aspiration, which happens when food or liquid gets stuck in a person's airway, had the unfortunate luck of getting Vicky as his nurse. And the same can be said for a 79-year-old woman with dementia who was being treated for a urinary tract infection. On December 29th, Vicky paid each patient a visit. She administered the mitocurium chloride into their IVs and left both of them to die, gasping for air until they could no longer breathe at all. Nurses rushed into their rooms to try and save them, but not Vicky. As her colleagues performed the same revival efforts they had for several patients before, Vicky stood silent in the back of their respective rooms and watched. Seven patients died on her shifts in less than three weeks, but Vicky wasn't done yet. In mid-January of 2001, Vicky entered the room of Jimmy Ray Holder, a syringe of myvacurium chloride in her hand. Jimmy's wife was also in the room, 
She was there to comfort her sick husband. As Vicky chatted with the couple, she injected Jimmy with his quote-unquote medication. He died minutes later. On another occasion, Vicky attempted to poison a 14-year-old high school girl right in front of her mother. The girl was recovering from an appendectomy. She was awake talking to her mother when Vicky came in and injected the poison. She started to gasp for air and turn blue. Her mother desperately called out, help my daughter. They were able to save her. And here's something to note about that particular patient. She had turned down Vicky's son for a date. And if you're saying to yourself, wow, she's getting bolder, you'd be right. But why wouldn't she? Not only was no one stopping her, no one was even the wiser. And why would they? Vicki Dawn Jackson was seen by all her colleagues as the perfect nurse. Kind, sweet, compassionate, competent, and above all, the consummate bedside caregiver. Through the rest of January, the list of people that Vicki killed grew. She administered the lethal medication to a 95-year-old patient who was successfully resuscitated by a team of nurses, marking the first time Vicky's seemingly flawless method failed. Four days later, Vicky returned to that room with another injection. This time, her patient did not survive. What's that expression again? If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Vicky got the message. On January 11th, two more patients were discovered dead in their beds. An 82-year-old pneumonia patient followed just hours later by a 78-year-old. Care to guess who last treated them? Then two more patients, an 82-year-old and a 46-year-old, died at Nakona General by the end of the month. Vicky tried but failed to kill two others who were able to call for help before their respiratory systems collapsed. The sizable uptick in deaths at the hospital, double the normal amount, alarmed families of the victims and members of the staff who also questioned how and why so many patients were dying so randomly. In early February, a pharmacy technician at the hospital noticed something strange. Several vials of myvicurium chloride were missing from their inventory. The pharmacy tech alerted the hospital's chief of staff. Hospital officials took a closer look at the records. The last nurse to be seen in each of the deceased patients' rooms was... Nurse Vicki Dawn Jackson. But they thought there was no way to prove she was responsible, so Vicki was never questioned by administrators, and she continued to work. On February 4th, 91 year old E.E. E. Jackson was admitted to the hospital for cellulitis and a high fever. Vicki knew this man. He was her husband's grandfather. When she finished up her work in his room, she quietly approached a group of other nurses. In a soft voice, she told them that she believed Mr. Jackson was dead. After a failed rescue effort, Vicki broke the sad news to her husband. He was devastated, and Vicki the devoted wife, comforted him. Two days after Jackson's death, hospital officials met with the Nakona chief of police to discuss the deaths and how to prove that Nurse Vicky was responsible. 
At this point, the only evidence they had was that, one, she was the last nurse to treat each deceased patient, and two, the unexplained missing mybacterium chloride vials. Those remain under lock and key, and Vicky had the key. With the help of the Texas Rangers and the FBI, police installed a hidden camera in the hospital's pharmaceutical unit. The goal? To catch Vicky stealing my vicurium chloride. As authorities waited for Vicky to fall into the trap, she, unaware of the investigation, decided to kill again, or at least try to kill again. On February 17th, Vicky entered the room of a 61-year-old male patient. He was being treated for post-polio syndrome, and he was responding well to his treatment. Just like she had so many times in the past several months, Vicky administered this medication into his IV. But once she left, he felt his chest get really tight. He could not talk, and it was nearly impossible to breathe. Meanwhile, Vicky went to her colleagues with concerns about the patient, who was, by this time, making snorting and horse-like sounds. The nurse's efforts to revive him worked. He was resuscitated, and when he felt well enough to speak, he told them that a blonde nurse put something in his IV. Guess who was the only nurse on duty with blonde hair? No one actually saw Vicky stealing vials of mybacurium chloride from the hospital. So, while executing a search warrant at her home, officers decided to search the garbage can outside. Inside the can was a used syringe. And I can tell you as a nurse, we don't bring used syringes home. The syringe was sent off to a lab for testing and came back positive for traces of, you guessed it, mybacurium chloride. Vicky and her husband were both questioned by police since both of them worked at Nakona General. Her husband told the cops he had no clue how or why the syringe was in their garbage. And Vicky told them the same thing. Further investigation with hospital officials revealed that her husband had no access at all to any medications, including aspirin. He was not even a registered nurse or licensed practical nurse. He was a nurse's aide. But Vicky had access... Oh, yes, she did. And Vicky, well, she seemed shocked when she learned that the deaths of so many patients at her hospital may have been the result of foul play. She even told officers that if the deaths were murders, she knew a few Nakona general staffers who could be responsible, but she offered no proof and... No names. The day after the syringe was found in Vicky's trash, both she and her husband were fired by the hospital. As news and gossip quickly spread through their small town, Vicky's husband buckled under the pressure and left. In fact, I was told by some police official when I interviewed Vicky for my investigation discovery TV show, Facing Evil, that not only did the police believe her husband was innocent of any involvement, but that some of them actually advised him to leave town for his own safety, not from the angry townsfolk, but from his own wife, Vicky. Vicky, however, she stayed in Nakona and continued to live her life like nothing ever happened. She went to the local bars and when she passed family members of the dead patients on the street, she stopped to talk with them. Despite the allegations made against her, 
months after being fired from Nakona General, Vicky found a new job at a nursing home in Gainesville, Texas. And that doesn't surprise me. Apparently, what happened had not been in the newspapers, and hospital administrators don't talk to each other. But that new job only lasted a few weeks. She was fired for guess what? Attempting to steal medication. Vicky's dream of a Florence Nightingale nursing career was over. Who wants to fuss with inserting a card into a reader, or worse, into a skimmer, where your card information can be stolen? Instead, pay the Apple way. Apple Pay is easy, secure, and built into iPhone. All you have to do is set it up. Just add a card in the Wallet app and you're good to go. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes with the world's best? Easily hundreds to thousands of dollars, but with a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. It's like Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. This holiday season, give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash Wondery. Right now, you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash Wondery. Masterclass.com slash Wondery. Offer terms apply. Vicki Don Jackson was born on February 13, 1966. Not much is known about her childhood, and there are conflicting reports about whether she was born in Texas or Indiana. But what we do know is that when she was 15, her family moved from Indiana to farm town Nakona, Texas. They lived in a ramshackle house and struggled to make ends meet. Vicky's father worked as a mechanic, and her mother was a cook at Nakona Nursing Home. According to Vicky, following the death of her great grandmother, her life dream was to become a nurse. As a girl, Vicky idolized Florence Nightingale, the legendary English nurse known for her passionate efforts to make hospitals cleaner and safer for wounded patients during the Crimean War. So, in her junior year of high school, she decided to work alongside her mother as a nurse's aide, giving her the experience she needed to pursue her dreams. Vicky loved her job. She treated every patient with kindness, even the unruly ones. And it was not just her patients who received her good side, Friends, family, and others who knew her described Vicky as a quiet and sweet, sweet girl. And that's exactly what drew Johnny McLaughlin to her. One night after her shift at the nursing home, Vicky went to a local arcade. After playing a few games, she was approached by Johnny, who worked in construction. He was five years older than Vicky, and he thought she was cute. And Vicky, who rarely attracted boys her own age, was soon enamored with him. Only a few weeks later, they married, but their relationship fell apart and they divorced about a year later. So Vicky moved back in with her parents. Though her romantic life suffered a huge blow, her nursing career was blossoming thanks to a full-time position at Nakona Nursing Home. Vicky's quest for Mr. Wright led her to start dating Leroy Carson, a local mechanic. Within six months, Vicky became pregnant. With a baby on the way, the couple decided to get married. They moved in together, and their son was soon born. 
In 1986, Vicki became pregnant again. She and Leroy welcomed their baby girl. Only a few years later, in 1989, Vicki officially became a licensed vocational nurse. That same year, she got a promotion to full-time night shift nurse. Despite her career moving in an upward direction, her relationship with her second husband was spiraling downward. He moved out of the family home, bored with Vicky and bored with the white picket fence facade they had built. Vicky was divorced again, and for a woman who craved love, she was left devastated. But she was determined to still find her Prince Charming. She began working out, which she thought would make her more attractive to men. Vicky started hiring babysitters to watch her kids and put on her best outfits and frequented bars and dance halls to find the one. One night, several years after her last divorce, she found him, 31-year-old Kirk Jackson, who also worked in healthcare. After only two months of dating, the pair got married. Kirk quickly found a new job as a nurse's aide at Nakona General Hospital. And in an attempt to spend more time with her third husband, Vicky left her nursing home job and took up a night shift nurse position at Nakona General. For a while, it seemed that Vicky had everything she wanted, a loving husband, a stable family life, and a career she was passionate about. But once again, Vicky's marriage started to crumble. Kirk liked to drink a lot. And most nights, he invited his buddies to the family home to play card games late into the night. This upset Vicky. She said the partying disrupted her children's sleep and that he should cut back on the alcohol. Kirk disagreed. He felt she was trying to control his life, and the fights got so bad that Vicky's children no longer felt safe in the home, and soon enough, they moved in with their biological father. Even though she was still with Kirk, Vicky felt alone. The constant turmoil sent her into a depression. She also started to experience mood swings and feelings of being rejected and unloved. Unable to cope with all of her problems by herself, she sought the help of a mental health counselor. After an evaluation, the counselor told Vicki that she had bipolar disorder. And the counselor also suggested that she take medication to manage the symptoms, meaning the mood swings. I talked about this with Vicki in our interview. She told me that she disagreed with the counselor's diagnosis and therefore she didn't need the medication. Big mistake. She also told her daughter about the visits to the counselor and the diagnosis. And when her daughter said, well, what does that mean? Vicky's response, and I quote, it means I could kill you and get away with it. No, I did not leave anything out of the story. Vicky did not kill her daughter or her ex-husband. But one has to wonder, why would she say such a thing? First of all, it's inaccurate. There are many people in the United States suffering or living with bipolar disorder, and the vast, vast, vast majority of them do not become serial killers. But one possible explanation is that Vicki was already thinking, if I kill someone, I won't get convicted. It made me wonder, were her murderous impulses beginning to surface? And if so, why? Why were they surfacing and why now? Simply being diagnosed bipolar does not equal becoming a serial killer. 
Absolutely not. Does that mean the psychiatrist missed something? No, it does not mean that at all. Most people don't say to their counselor, by the way, I thought you should know I have random thoughts of killing people. They just don't. We can never know for sure what led Vicky to turn her passion for nursing into killing helpless patients. But we can certainly take a very close look at it. I think a closer look at Vicky's motivations to murder can be seen in her choice of victims, the weak and the infirm. Those patients most dependent on her physically. Perhaps Vicky had a deep-seated need to have people dependent on her, and that is why she loved being a nurse so much. However, I don't think her choice of victims is a complete head-scratcher either. She had a ready pool of them at her fingertips. I also do not think, based on my training, Vicky just woke up one day and decided to kill a little old lady for no reason. No, I do not. It was because of a confluence of circumstances, meaning access to people who were dependent on her and could not fight back, and a lot of very negative factors going on in her life at the time, not the least of which was her third marriage falling apart and her children feeling so unsafe, they chose to leave her and Eric. In the world of profiling and behavioral analysis, we call that a precipitating factor. All of Vicky's problems, her personal problems, her family problems, probably contributed to a clinical depression and, no doubt, a lot of anger. Let us not forget, as a child, teenager, and young woman, Vicky craved love and attention, and now she was losing it from the people she loved the most. But there's more to why Vicky became a killer than that. Way more. Many healthcare serial killers do it to gain attention and admiration from their peers, and they do that by poisoning them, then they're the first ones to find the patient struggling to live and save them. But that's not what was going on with Vicky. No, it was not. She seems to have been motivated by exerting power over others, perhaps a power she had lost in her personal life. There's an excellent chance She was at an all-time low when she killed her first patient, Donnie Jennings. And after it was over, she realized that she liked it. It did something for her. And, you know, when you closely look at the actual act of taking another person's life from them, what greater power can there be? More than one serial killer has described that the actual act of taking a life or allowing the individual to live is godlike. By the way, it was Ted Bundy that first said that. Because murdering soon became repetitive with Vicky, I think it restored her sense of security that she did have power after all maybe a power that she'd lost in her personal life. Every time Vicky killed and got away with it, and her close colleagues not even suspecting her because she was such a kind and compassionate nurse, not getting caught was reinforcement to do it again and again and again. After she was arrested, she was diagnosed by a psychiatrist as being a narcissist and a psychopath. And by the way, those are correct diagnoses. What that meant, she felt no guilt or remorse for those she hurt. But once she actually killed a patient, well, that was over. But there was more she could do to make herself feel good 
and that was inflict pain on their relatives and their friends. I think she enjoyed being the bearer of bad news to the families of her victims. Just a little dash of emotional sadism to sprinkle on top of the power high she was enjoying from killing their loved one. And that remark she made to her daughter about what bipolar meant, that, quote, I could kill you and get away with it? Well, now that we know she became a serial killer, an analysis of that statement quite clearly means to me that Vicky believed she could get away with murder. I find it so interesting that Vicky refused to accept the bipolar diagnosis and take the medication which might have prevented these tragedies, but she still used it as an excuse to go ahead and kill. And by the way, that is not what it means. Did Vicky really believe if she was diagnosed bipolar, she could get away with murder? Well, when I asked her about it in our interview, she claimed she did not say that to her daughter. It's 2023, and it appears that we can't buy things anymore. We can only subscribe to them. There's subscriptions for everything these days, from streaming services to razors, fitness programs to pet food, even bacon of the month. It's no wonder it can feel impossible to keep tabs on what you're paying for every month. That's why I'm a huge fan of Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. With over 5 million users and counting, Rocket Money has helped save its customers an average of $720 a year and $1 billion in total savings so far. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. That's rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. Rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. After being fired from the Gainesville nursing home, Vicki ventured out into a new career as a grocery store clerk. But that one, it didn't last either. In July of 2002, police showed up to the store and arrested her during her shift. Unbeknownst to Vicki, just months after she was let go from Nakona General, exhumations of her former patients began. Autopsies of her victims concluded that their bodies contained traces of myvicurium chloride. She was charged with four counts of capital murder, and her bond was set at $2 million. Despite the suspicions surrounding Vicky for the past several months, friends, family, and acquaintances were shocked to hear the news. How could the soft-spoken, sweet Vicki Don Jackson be arrested for murder? Her husband, Kirk, also grappled with the possibility that his own grandfather was one of her victims. Around the same time of her arrest, lawsuits against Nakona General Hospital were piling up. Families demanded that they be compensated for her criminal behavior. For them, the fact that Vicki could get away with so many murders without being fired was uh, extremely frustrating. In January of 2004, after spending two years in jail, Vicki was charged with six more counts of capital murder bringing the total to 10 victims. However, the Texas district attorney later said in court that the number of suspected victims, both dead and surviving, was closer to 25. A year later, Vicki's trial began in the neighboring area of Archer City, Texas. The trial focused on two of her 10 suspected victims. If convicted, she faced life in prison or the death penalty. But prosecutors decided 
not to seek it in her case. It ended in a mistrial. And for the next several months, her case was put on hold and sent to the appeals court for review. After they attempted to figure out if she could go to trial again, Vicki was evaluated by two psychiatrists. Their goal? To see whether or not she was even competent to stand trial. One psychiatrist concluded that Vicki had, quote, mixed personality disorder with antisocial, narcissistic, and histrionic personality traits. Yikes. That is a Webster's Dictionary of Mental Problems. She also concluded that Vicky was a manipulator who enjoyed having power over others. I couldn't agree more. Overall, the psychiatrist found Vicky fit to stand trial. And that makes sense. She was not hearing voices. She was not delusional. She was bent and twisted. She also contended that Vicky had the, quote, personality traits of someone who could have committed the offenses of which she is accused. Well, she was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Many of the killers we have highlighted on Killer Psyche had the exact same diagnosis. In October of 2006, Vicki was granted another trial. But when she learned that her own daughter would testify against her, she pleaded no contest. But Vicki maintained her innocence and claimed then, as she does today, that she never killed anyone. Vicki was convicted on all 10 counts of capital murder and was sentenced to life in prison. In 2015, Vicki and her defense team sought another trial and a dismissal of writ. That means they were trying to get evidence out. They claimed that a syringe believed to be used in one of the murders would prove her innocent if it was sent for another DNA test. The court denied the request. Vicki Dawn Jackson remains in the Christina Melton Crane Unit in Gatesville, Texas, to serve out her life sentence. She will not be eligible for parole until at least 2042. I will be 92 years old then, and hopefully she will not be my nurse. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review. Follow Killer Psyche on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen one week early and ad-free. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. By supporting them, you help us offer the show for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a survey at wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Additional writing and director of research is Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corpy and Matt Dyson. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Wachneen, and the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are myself, Candace DeLong, Kelly Garner, 
and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Trying to grab all the groceries in one trip? Oof, not how you would have done that. You know sometimes less is more. Like when you drive less and save with the USAA annual mileage discount. USAA, get a quote today. Hey, hey.